Hi, my name is Kat and you're watching Kat Rose Astrology. And today I've got a video about the lunar eclipse in Taurus. So uh, this is kind of a big one. I'm, I'm going to just give you a brief uh, overview of what an eclipse is before we get going. So eclipses basically happen whenever we have a new moon or a full moon, but when that moon is happening, um, conjunct one of the moon's nodes. And the nodes are basically formed when the moon's path crosses that of the sun. So it's, it's basically thought of as a really uh, more perfectly aligned new moon or full moon. And for that reason, you can think of them as more amped up or exaggerated lunations. So with this lunar eclipse today, this is like an amped up full moon. And a full moon generally represents things like culminations, conclusions, um, illuminations, realizations, as that, that moon becomes big and bright in the sky. But yeah, like I said, this is kind of more extreme, particularly in terms of a cycle, a bigger cycle in our lives, reaching a peak or an ending. So those are just some general things before we get into it. And what I'm going to start by looking at is the first quarter moon that we recently had uh, on Wednesday, Wednesday, the 1st of November. And the reason I look at these quarter moons is that they're kind of like stepping stones or bridging points between uh, new moons and full moons. So we had the solar eclipse um, just less than two weeks ago. This is the first quarter that came in between where the moon was square the sun. And the thing that I noted when we, we last met was this idea that the moon was in Aquarius and approaching Saturn. Um, and the fact that my, my kind of focus here was what it means to make an adjustment during eclipse time. So let's say things have been shifting in our lives through this eclipse season. Uh, and, you know, we got these eclipses earlier on in the year during springtime. And we're sort of just figuring out how to adapt to this new normal, as, as it were. Aquarius is actually a really interesting sign for that to be happening in because it's not just going to be uh, a moon that's sat around moping or bypassing the pain. Um, it's going to be a more imaginative moon. And we might be looking more outside of ourselves from support from community. Uh, we might crowdsource our problems, ask a friend. And that's kind of what I think of Aquarius. Um, when I think of Aquarius at its best, it's that sign that reminds us that we are connected to a wider network and to make the most of that. And as with all first quarters, the challenge that we're set isn't necessarily going to be easy. I think that's amplified by the fact that the moon is approaching Saturn. So it might be that we're feeling very under-resourced, disconnected, and a bit, bit of an outsider in whatever problems that we're, we're facing here. And that's fine. It's just that at this first quarter moon, the story was around us getting clear about that, getting clear about the challenges that we faced, and then figuring out, maybe being inspired by what what solutions that, that were coming through. This is the kind of stepping stone to the, to the lunar eclipse. Let, now let's just move forward to the day of the lunar eclipse. So this is happening on the 8th of November at exactly 16 degrees of Taurus. So sun is at 16 Scorpio, moon is at 16 Taurus. It's a Venus ruled lunation and uh, Venus is still in Scorpio. The other thing to note about this, uh, this eclipse is that the moon is conjunct Uranus. And, and like, unlike the Scorpio eclipse, which was a partial eclipse, this is actually very tight with the moon's node. So you see the, the north node there, it's the north node eclipse at 13 degrees. Venus, um, what I would say in general about this eclipse, oh, a fly is attacking me, is that Venus things are coming to a head and we're not being allowed to bypass them. So Venus things, we're thinking about things like relationships, relationships of all kinds, um, the feminine, arts, artists, our idea of beauty and what we value, just some things. Venus and Scorpio, and one of the classic kind of myths that, that I think a lot of us go to with Venus and Scorpio is a version of the goddess in the underworld. And a great one for that is the Mesopotamian goddess of the dead, Rishkigal. Um, and well, really... It's the myth where uh, Inanna, who I think in some myths it says that they're sisters, but in others they don't. Anyway, Urshkigal is the goddess of, of the dead. She's in the underworld. And Inanna, um, who is more of a kind of a standard Venusian goddess, um, begins her descent into the underworld. 
And in order to make it past the seven gates between the, the overworld and the underworld, Erishkigal has bolted um, each of these gates and tells Inanna she must remove one item of clothing um, to get through each, through each gate. So she does that. She, she proceeds through each gate, removing one article of clothing and also loses her magic items and, and all of these, these things. But finally, once she's gotten through all of the seven gates, she finds herself, you know, as you would by then. I don't, I don't think I'm wearing seven items of clothing today. So you'd find yourself naked, powerless, and standing before the throne of Arishkagal, goddess of the underworld. And I, I feel like this is this is Venus in, in Scorpio, Venus in a sign that is out of her depth. Effectively, what happens to Inanna then is that she is put upon these, um, she's put in front of seven judges and they declare her to be guilty. And then it's, it's, it's pretty bad, but eventually she gets saved. What I love about this, this myth, and feel free to look it up in more depth and like ignore my, my very quick uh, overview, is that it's very evocative of what I feel we get to experience when Venus is in Scorpio, particularly when she's in the sky as an evening star and then is becoming visible again. So she, Venus is not uh, considered visible right now. She's still under the beams of the sun. Um, and yet, you know, this, this, as we know, that doesn't last forever. Venus will eventually separate from the sun and, and kind of emerge from the underworld again. So maybe you've been feeling like you've been undergoing a series of tests during this eclipse season, and maybe each of them have demanded that you shed something of your old self. I think that's a theme that I got into with the solar eclipse in Scorpio. We we're thinking a lot about loss and sacrifice. But I think the trick here is really not seeing this as a forceful removal or one that we're being, you know, just goaded into, um, but a willing give, giving, a kind of offering. So my questions, the questions that I've been meditating on is what can all of this giving or stripping away give us back? You know, what, what's, what do we get um, when we sacrifice these things? And I'm thinking about this because Taurus, Venus's earthly home, um, or er earthy home, is a place of gain, of life, of prosperity and safety, uh, which I think are things that we generally want in life. We generally like these things. Uh, and, you know, of course, this is going to be personal to each of us. Um, I'm going to share some general prompts at the end to hopefully give you, you ideas on, on what those themes could be based on your rising sign. But just as an example, let's say earlier in the year or maybe around the solar eclipse, somebody ghosted you and you were pissed off, understandably. And you had to have a kind of descent into the underworld, facing the loss of a potential partner or friend and maybe face your own part that you played in it. You know, part of the Inanna myth was that she was deemed guilty um, at, at some point. And maybe you played no part in it. And ultimately that person was just a douchebag. Regardless, you're still angry, upset, disappointed. And that's what you have the opportunity now to strip away, to let go of. You know, and you might need to forgive that person, as hard as that might sound. Uh, but what you get for letting go of that hurt, that resentment, is a wonderful, unshakable feeling of a freedom, a self-love, a compassion for yourself that no one can take away. And in that way, there's actually a lot to gain by 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 loss or by offering this, this, this up. And it's a very solid foundation that we get left with. It's like when everything goes away, like whatever is left, that's, that's solid. That's that we know is real. Note that this is also an eclipse. So I'm not so interested in doing rituals and spells. In fact, I think I would advise against it tr traditionally not recommended. Uh, but you might in the days following it, um, you know, if you're somebody who has that, that kind of practice, then, you know, think about a kind of release, a releasing spell or ritual, a forgiveness ritual. Um, and maybe again, the, the journal prompts might be help, helpful with that. Um, a lot of people are focusing as well on Uranus being in the mix here. So it's, it's a hard one really to speak about because one thing that we can say is, well, the events surrounding this eclipse might be unexpected, chaotic, unpredictable, uh, destabilizing. Um, even if it's on a wider collective level, which I'm just not you know, clued up on the news enough to really speak to. But this is, this is another thing to keep in, in mind right now, that things could feel just very globally uh, chaotic right now. But like I said, if you're going to kind of make this into more of a personal thing, I recommend 
just journaling, um, maybe a simple prayer, but lay, laying low on the day of the eclipse, if we can, is usually recommended. Don't put too much on our plates. Um, the tarot card for this Deccan, right? So this is a, a card, as hopefully you can see this, this person who's feeding what appears to be poor or suffering people. Uh, and there, there are coins or pentacles all around him. It's really a card of giving, of receiving, of sharing wealth, generosity and charity. These are all, you know, quite Taurian themes. So I also think that, you know, that theme of Inanna stripping away all of her earthly possessions, everything that she had to feel safe uh, is, is quite an interesting theme. Um, and this idea that we don't have to do it in a forced way, we can do it willingly and graciously. So this card speaks to the fact that we get to choose to give from a place of plentitude, not through loss or force. There's also a sense that this doesn't mean it being totally reliant on somebody else or them on you. Ultimately, it speaks to self-sufficiency, uh, but the kind that can only happen through the initial support of a benefactor. So maybe you need somebody like this to kind of get you going, and that might be a blessing of this lunation. But ultimately, there's a, there's a, a longer story where we're ultimately aiming to be self-sufficient. I'm just going to get to the what's ahead now. Let's look to the last quarter, which is coming through on the 16th of November. So this is at 24 degrees of Leo. Uh, the sun in this case is ruling this moon. And we've got, you know, loosely to an extent, but we've got a grand cross forming between these fixed, fixed signs right now. We've got Saturn and Aquarius. Uranus and Taurus and the, the luminaries in Scorpio and Leo. So the way I was trying to just process this was I was thinking about all of the fixed signs and how, um, if, if you group them depending on your rising sign. So if you have a, um, a fixed rising sign like, like this chart effectively, uh, so Aquarius, these four places are going to be in what I would call the four corners of life, right? So it's it's self, home, uh, relationships, work, like kind of like often the big things for people who uh, come to see me for an astrology reading, we, we often want to talk about these things. And it's usually, you know, when things are going well in these houses, that's usually how we define ourselves, our happiness, our success. Um, so for fixed signs, just to say, fixed sign risings, this is going to be a more um, prominent series of events and that this this last quarter is really speaking to um, one of those life areas and kind of all of them uh, so something that we feel we are ready to shift uh, often with the last quarters where we're getting a realization that something needs to change and it's usually not it's not an easy one and it doesn't usually speak to growth it, again we're thinking more about what 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 do we need to lose or leave behind? If you have a, a cardinal sign like Aries, Cancer, Libra um, on the Ascendant, then this will be happening across the houses 2, 5, 8, and 11. Think about those as the four corners of support. They're all related in some way to you know, where we get support, how we support others, what activities support us, uh, and the people around us that support us. So thinking about those themes as being the things that are going through, under, undergoing a kind of change right now. And then finally, if you have a mutable ascendant like Gemini, then this is happening in the Cadent houses, three, six, nine, or 12, um, which I, I was kind of undecided about what I would call these, but I'm thinking about four corners of mind, body, spirit, soul, um, or the four corners of the in-between, because these are very much stepping stone houses. They're not necessarily associated with joy, but they are massively associated with meaning, with substance, with character building and soul building, uh, and speak frequently to temporary experiences that help us grow and deepen. So again, these are some things that, you know, if you're going through hell right now with the fixed stuff happening on, on these angles, um, then know that Again, something is shifting here, and uh, this is the necessary step before the new thing comes in. You know, and we get this every 29 and a half days. We get a last quarter moon um, every month. So my suggestion is just to think about those life areas 
you know, as, as holes, as I described, and ask what might need to change in general, what might need to, to give. And sometimes it's a matter of changing our expectations of that life area. So if you're not feeling terribly supported right now, uh, then, you know, so what, what, how can we, we change our expectations about that and uh, think about how we're supporting ourselves? Um, and the next lunation that's leading up to this, this is all leading up to a new moon in Sagittarius, which is a much more jolly thing to talk about, uh, which we will get to. I think um, I'll be holding a moon circle for that on Monday, the 21st of November. Okay, so before we wrap up, I'm just going to share the journal prompts for this eclipse. I'm going to start, I'm just going to put Taurus on the ascendant. So if you've got Taurus rising, uh, this is going to be happening in your first house. We're thinking about themes such as health, identity, well-being, and maybe already this year you've been going through some massive shifts in that life area. My journal prompt is to think about what have you gained from embracing these changes? You know, even if you felt like there was loss um, or strife, chaos, what has this given you? You know, maybe that's a sense that there is something more permanent than your personality or your body um, that we can't see, but is very, very real. So if you have Aries on the Ascendant, then this is, a, this is going to be happening in your second house of finances. Um, it's, well, it's usually a house that we associate with the tangible things in life, money, car, Rolex, but there's much, much more to it. It's really, you know, talking about that theme of support with the, the cardinal signs, um, this happening in that axis, what supports you? So regardless of your outer wealth or possessions, how have your inner resources or inner sense of support grown or changed throughout this year? What have you gained? Even if, you know, even if that's not been a bank balance, what, what has been gained in that time? Pisces on the ascendant, it's going to be in your third house of media consumption, siblings, neighbors, uh, where your mental attention is going. So my journal prompt is, what have you gained from changes to your daily rituals? You know, the little things in life that make, that lead up to the big stuff. How have any changes here made you more present, more aware of the life areas that we frequently take for granted. With Aquarius rising, this is happening in your fourth house of home, family, roots. Maybe things have been kind of unstable around this life area. So my journal prompt is, despite the possible chaos in home or living arrangements or family, what have you received or gained from going through the storm? With Capricorn rising, this is going to be happening in your fifth house, themes such as hobbies, children, creativity. Uh, what have you learned about joy in your life throughout this, this time? How has your creativity, your procreativity even, paid back? If you have a Sagittarius on the Ascendant, uh, this will be happening in your sixth house of work or health. So maybe things have been a bit of a grind in the past year. Maybe there's been loss, like loss of a pet or something. The sixth house does speak to small animals. Or the new possibility of, of one. It's really a house that speaks a lot to giving, giving of our kind of time and energy. So what have you received through these hardships? What has it meant to you to rise to the challenge that the sixth house presents us with? How has that made you stronger, more compassionate? With Scorpio rising, this is happening in your seventh house of relationships. So maybe your you know, close relationship or uh, even your relationship to relationships, so your kind of expectations around them, um, has undergone some shifts this year. What have you gained in this life area? And maybe it's felt like it's been all give or even loss, but has that awareness taught you something? Maybe taught you something about boundaries, for example. With Libra rising, this is happening in um, your eighth house. So we're thinking about finances, but mostly debt or tax related, things that we get from other people, things that we give to others. Maybe you've been going through it a bit in terms of, you know, the, the stresses of what, what you owe or, um, or are owed, or just generally being wrapped up in other people's junk. My journal prompt is for now, just forget about who owes who what and reflect on what you've gained from the people you've leaned on and from them leaning on you. You know, it's like the time and emotional investment in being present with somebody when they're going through a crisis. 
it might be very taxing on us, but it's also deeply rewarding in knowing that we've provided some, some support there. With Virgo rising, this is in your ninth house. So we're thinking about themes such as spirituality, learning, um, ex exploring foreign lands. And maybe your mind has been growing, evolving, learning new things, experiencing new places. My general prompt is to reflect on the sacrifices made in order to expand your horizons and what you've gained from that. Even if there have been some like disappointments along the way. Um, like I think the ninth house has a lot of sacrifice involved. I think about uh, my favorite country to visit is Japan. And it's also one of the most pricey places to visit. And uh, when I go, I have to save up for a long time, but it's very much worth it. It's, it's This is the kind of like, even though we're parting with that money, it's like worth it. Uh, in what we get back. With Leo rising, this is in your 10th house of career. So maybe your career or your public image, how you're seen in the world has been undergoing some real big changes. My general prompt for you is to think about what you've given and what you've gained as a result in your career. You know, maybe you've put in loads of extra hours and it feels like no one's noticed, but perhaps you've gained something, even just like a personal sense of pride in your work. With cancer rising, this is happening in your 11th house of allies. And maybe your allies have changed this year. Maybe you've lost some, maybe you've gained some. And you might be just feel quite on your own right now, but you're much more self-sufficient than you think. And my general prompt is to reflect on the way that your allies have supported you up until now and what that's given you and which of these things no one can take from you. And finally, Gemini rising. This is the place the 12th place, place of, uh, it's really what we're, we're less aware of. Often lunar eclipses, full moons, generally very helpful for shining a light into those kind of dusty, dark corners that we generally don't want to look at. So my journal prompt is, what have you gained from going through any dark nights of the soul this year? Has there been a sense of your resilience, your determination for life and growth that has shone through? Okay, so those are the journal prompts. I hope that's been helpful. And I hope that lunar eclipse goes well for you. Um, and I would love to know in the comments below how you're expecting this to affect you. Um, what life area is this going to be happening for you? Um, if you enjoyed this, I invite you to click like. Please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And as always, thank you for watching and happy lunar eclipse.